Columbia University has released a report on the Rolling Stone article on the alleged University of Virginia rape, and they have noted that that article, written by Sabrina Rubin Erdley, was a journalistic failure that was avoidable. Now, just to fill you in on some details on that story, it was a very, very long feature story in Rolling Stone magazine where they talked about an alleged rape victim under the name Jackie. Now, that was a pseudonym for the girl. Um, I am not going to reveal her real identity here. I'm not even really sure of what her real identity is. But nonetheless, the article had many, many massive journalistic errors in it, including the fact that it was reported with only one source and one perspective, and that was the perspective of the alleged victim, Jackie. Now, uh, the ringleader of this rape that occurred at a fraternity, uh, Phi Kappa Psi, was apparently someone who didn't even exist, and all it took was a little digging for the reporter to figure that out, but the reporter didn't do the necessary digging, which is why Columbia has released this report and called the report, or the article in Rolling Stone, a journalistic failure. Now let me give you some more from the uh, Columbia Review. The failure encompassed reporting, editing, editorial supervision, and fact-checking. The magazine set aside as unnecessary essential practices of reporting that, if pursued, would likely have led the magazine's editors to reconsider publishing Jackie's narrative so prominently, if at all. So Jackie had alleged that she attended a fraternity party and someone, the ringleader in this case, led her up to a room where she was allegedly raped by seven people. Now, a lot of her perspectives were actually conflicting with the testimony of other people, but the unfortunate thing about this article was that the testimony of other people wasn't even included. In fact, it wasn't even acknowledged or even considered for the article, which is why Columbia wrote such a scathing review of what Rolling Stone published. That's, I mean, look, Oh, that's great. Like, uh, you, so you, you actually teach journalism mm -hmm. at a university. I am not a journalism student. I didn't do it in college. I don't consider myself a, a traditional journalist. But even I've watched Newsroom. I know some of the most basic <laughs> things you're supposed to do. And they always stress you have to have multiple reliable sources. How could you go? Like, such a big case, su such an obviously high-profile, important case targeting a university, when this is something that the country was so focused on, was the, the perceived lack of response by universities to people who've been sexually assaulted, to, 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 to just go based on one person's word seems insane. And I could understand if maybe it was a one-person operation and she wanted to get the story out, mm -hmm. but that it made it through what are supposed to be other checks and balances, and it was not stopped along the way. It's crazy. It seems as though there were no checks and balances. And remember, it wasn't early working alone in publishing this article. There were editors who also mm -hmm. read it, who greenlit it, and published it. And so there was obviously an issue with the way that this article was written, but the system in place to fact check it and publish it obviously had some issues as well. So my biggest issue is not only that this is a, an article that I think defames an entire university, an entire fraternity, I, my issue with this is the fact that it calls into question any type of rape allegation that's made by anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when it comes to a university setting. There are numerous stories that are similar like this, where a girl claims that she went to a frat party uh, and then she was raped, right? And I guarantee you that the majority of those stories are true. Yeah. But you hear things like this, and then it, all of a sudden everyone's skeptical. Yeah. And so she's not, the article and the, the reporter here is not doing anyone any favors by not taking into account the perspectives and the facts that other people have to share. Yeah. It's really a big issue. Yeah, I mean, it seems crazy, but we, we experience this all the time in the comments. Like, there are, there are rape apologists out there who just desperately wanted this to happen because mm -hmm. they want you to believe that 80% of the women who say they've been raped are lying. Some percent do lie. I don't know what the percent is. I know that it's not more than 50% or mm -hmm. whatever it is that they say it is. And this gives them, they will cite this for the next 50 years. They will continually say, well, look, you can't trust them. And that's why they had to be so careful. Look, look, it's Rolling Stone. I know it's not the New York Times or something like that. But they're still seen as a reputable source for stories of this sort. I don't know how they could have possibly let this through. The idea yeah. that the fraternity wouldn't have pushed back, that the national fraternity that represents them wouldn't, that the university wouldn't have pushed back, and especially at a time 
when it seemed like there was enough public pressure to get universities to start doing something about this. I'm not saying that this is going to derail all of those efforts, but it certainly hurts the effort to Absolutely. get them to take it seriously. There's no question about that. And, you know, in terms of Rolling Stone uh, being a reputable source of news, I mean, you have people like Matt Taibbi writing for them. And Matt Taibbi mm -hmm. has written some incredible pieces when it comes to the financial sector and some of the terrible things that they've done to violate, uh, you know, the financial system and yeah. all of that. So there are articles that are published there that are worth reading and they are credible. But when it comes to this specific article, yeah. Erdley did a terrible job. Her editors did a terrible job. And I'm glad that the Washington Post did an investigation into this and they figured out, hey, you know what? They're only taking Jackie's testimony into account and that's a big issue. Yeah. Now let me give you some more from uh, Columbia's review. The published story glossed over the gaps in the magazine's reporting by using pseudonyms and by failing to state where important information had come from. So the Charlottesville police, after conducting 70 interviews, already concluded last month that there is no evidence to support Jackie's claims in the article. So Washington Post did their investigation, Columbia did their investigation, Police in Charlottesville did their investigation, and so it seems as though huge portions of this story were made up. Do you think? Do you think that it's like professional laziness? Like they said that they tried to contact the three other friends, but then eventually gave up. Or do you think it's that in this case at least they just put too much trust in? Like you don't want to be the person who questions someone who says that they were raped. Do you think it's that sort of thing? Like there's yeah. a stigma against questioning that? I think that it's a combination of many things. I think that there was uh, a lack of journalistic integrity and ethics here. And I also think that there was a little bit of fear in questioning a, an alleged rape victim too much. Yeah. And Jackie in this case was not easy to work with. Erdley would lose contact with her because she would just disappear. And it was really frustrating. So at one point, Erdley wanted to know the exact name of the alleged ringleader of this rape. And when she said, I need to know her name, or his name, I apologize, Jackie just disappeared for a few weeks. And then Erdley finally got back in touch with her and said, okay, you know, we're trying to publish this article, so um, I'm going to go with this pseudonym. And after that, Erd, uh, the, Jackie apparently was willing to work with her again. Right there, there's a huge red flag. Yeah. Why is she losing communication with you when you're asking her a very legitimate question about this alleged rape? Yeah. And then her friends weren't interviewed for this article. There were people that should have just been interviewed for the article, and they weren't. And yeah, so there was crazy. laziness and a lack of ethics there. Yeah. Anyway. No, I, just, I, I, I mean, I feel bad, obviously, for the frat who didn't deserve to have their name tarnished for a while before the retractions. But also, perversely, someday a sexual assault is going to happen committed by someone in the frat. Are people going to believe it? I mean, this is a major university. Since this report happened, women have been, women and men, but especially women have been sexually assaulted at that university. And you know that there was probably a second thought or jokes made at their expense. Like, it's just, it's so, it's so terrible on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. And so far, nobody's losing their job or anything. I'm not the, the person to push for people to lose their jobs, but in this case, I could sort of understand how that might happen. I totally agree with you. I feel sick saying this person should lose their job, but yeah. I just know that in most settings, when it comes to yeah. a reputable news source, if someone shows this level of negligence in a story, they usually do lose their job. Yeah. So I don't know how this is going to end up. Unless but it, they're Bill O'Reilly. But it, unless they're Bill O'Reilly, <laughs> then you can lie as much as you yeah, want. You get away with it. Exactly. But um, remember, it's not just Erdly; it's the editors as well that yeah. greenlit the story.